we talked about the foreknowledge of God, the fact that God knew what was going to happen. And sometimes that's a bit alarming because the things that happen in our lives, we look at and think, how could he have let that happen if he knew it was going to happen? And yet we also know, as Romans 8 teaches us, all things work together for good. Everything is there for a purpose, no matter whether it's good or bad. It's teaching us. It's it's being used by God to do something in us and in the world and in his plan, his overall big picture. I uh, had a preacher from... Um, Uh, Florida that I used to listen to and he used to talk about that illustration of looking at the underside of a um, tapestry and how chaotic it looks and yet if you were to look at it from God's point of view or the upper side you'd see just how beautiful it is and often we don't have that opportunity uh, unless we look at things through God's eyes instead of our own. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse, uh, we're going to read a passage. Actually, I'll tell you what, we want to do something a bit different. I want you to help me. I want the first one who finds this passage is going to actually, I would like you to read it out this morning and not have to hear me read it to you. So Romans chapter 8, we want to read... Eight verses 18 through 25. So when you get there, pop your hand up. Andrew, he, did you win at Bible drills when you were younger? You, you know, <laughs> you know. Oh, but if you'd read that, that passage for us, please. 18 through 25 of Romans 8. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Amen. Amen. Title of the message this morning, and I do want to read a few other passages uh, to before I actually speak to you, but is he knows. Considering that this is the beginning of the year, and we reflect often upon the year that we've just passed and the one which is to come, we consider the fact this year about the foreknowledge of God, the fact that God actually knew and knows what's happened to us. It hasn't struck him as a surprise, even if it has us, but also that God has a future for us. We read passages like that, and occasionally I feel like God kind of pulls the curtain back and shows us a bit of what is yet to be revealed, but that he is working. He has a plan. When he left earth and ascended to heaven. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. He's been busy while he's been away as he was when he was here. But we read other passages as well, and I'm going to read these, and if you'd like to turn or take notes on them, please do. Philippians chapter 1, there's a verse in verse 6, which is a powerful verse concerning the future. Verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's Jesus who began the work in us, and it's him who will complete it. I love that because I think there is a, a, a part that says that while he has given us a responsibility, there are some of us who feel like he's dumped it on us. 
You know, we feel as if, yeah, he gave us a job to do, and then he kind of sat back and folded his arms and said, get on with it, get on and do it. And yet that's that's not what the Scripture teaches. The Scripture teaches that actually he's there with us, working alongside us. And if we get tired and can't finish it, he will complete it. It is his job to see that work done in us. So it will never go unfinished. He almost, and I I put this on it, and I've talked about it before, it's almost as if he's given us the privilege to participate in our lives. He could just do it all for us, but instead he's given us the privilege and opportunity to be involved as well with the promise that if we can't, if we fail, if we fall over, he will be there to finish the work. It's him who's done that. Proverbs chapter 19 is another, verse 21. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. I read that sometimes and thought, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that God gives us a choice and then he reveals to us what his plan really was and it had nothing to do with ours? You're going to laugh when I say it, but... Have you ever, men, have you ever been asked by your wife or a a, a lady to help you choose something? And it isn't necessarily about your choice. It's about whether you're going to pick the right one, you know, because you could get it wrong. And you've just had this sense of this is a trick question, isn't it? You're asking me a choice, but there's really one you've already got in mind and you just want to see if I'm going to get it right. But I mean, the, all the joke aside, God doesn't do that to us. God doesn't have it so that there is one thing and he just wants to see. He, he gives us these choices and gets us involved. And his whole plan for us is that ultimately his plan will be what comes to fruition. And it may be that he takes that detour, even though it's not one, detour through our life struggles and trials to get us to that point. But the encouragement is, and listen, those of you that follow sat-navs and end up at the dead end, if we end up taking a right or taking a left, God's going to get us to where he wants us to go. We will not get lost. We will not end up completely way away from our goal. God ultimately will get us to where he wants us to be. And these are the promises of the fact that he knows and he has a promise for us. 1 Peter, chapter uh, 1 and verse 3 and 4. Praise be to the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a new, into, uh, sorry, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. There is a promise, a living hope, an inheritance. There is a goal, there is a reward at the end of this journey that God has set aside and protected, and no man can steal it away from us. It's his promise and his desire for us to give that to us. I won't make you turn, but you know the verse in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. You can't help but consider the future and have heard that verse that says, I know the plans I have for you, uh, to plans to prosper you and give you a future and a hope. I mean, many different versions give us that in a different way. I think probably the reason it's so popular today is because of the way the NIV puts it. Because there's a future and a hope and it becomes a promise that we cling on to. The King James language gave it to us a little bit different um, because it talks about having a, I think the words that are used is an expected end. You might look at that and say, well, that's not really all that hopeful. And yet the consistency of the teaching of the passage is that God gives us a a goal and a desire and knowing that if you knew the end, you would know that end isn't death. That end is the inheritance, the reward, the beauty of what God has planned and all of the things he has in store for us. 
So I say this at the beginning of the year, as we start and launch into January, that this is some, a promise to hold on to that should and hopefully will encourage us throughout the year. I have four points I want to give you this morning, and I'm going to do something I've absolutely never done before. I think I say that each time I've preached here, but I'm going to do something I've never done before. I'm going to give you these four points in the form of a poem. I'm going to have you repeat it because you're going to remember this. This just happened as I was writing them down. I thought, this kind of rhymes, goes together, it's easy to remember. Here are the four points. I'm going to give them to you, and then we'll talk just for a moment more about them. Number one, you have a purpose. Number two, he has a plan. Number three, he made a promise. Number four, on which you can stand. Now, how good is that? You know, I just wrote that down. I thought, wait, wait a minute. That's not four points. That's a poem. I was always taught in homiletics that every sermon needs at least three points in a poem. So I was thinking, this really fits. But I want you to repeat it with me, and I want it to be something that you can think about during the week, you can think about during the year, you can cling on to and hold on to, that it will give you hope, that it will keep you from getting discouraged, that will pull you out of the ditch when you are, it will be something that you can cling to and know that God has a plan. Here it is. You have a purpose. He has a plan. He made a promise on which you can stand. Can you do it with me? You have a purpose. He has a plan. He made a promise on which you can stand. One more time. Here we go. You have a purpose. He has a plan. He made a promise on which you can stand. Throughout the scripture, we have promises. We have encouragement that from the time of our first failure until ultimately our glorification, when God gives us a new body, some of us would like that sooner than others, you know. But when it all happens and God brings it all to fruition, from the time of our first failure, we go back as far as the Garden of Eden, when man was given an opportunity and he disastrously failed God. And we were with him in spirit because there's not a person of us who haven't failed and fallen short. From that time to the end, God has given us the promise that he has good things in store for us. He has a desire for us that brings about prosperity and reward. You say, well, I'm supposed to serve without reward. I love the street pastors. I love the fact that it is, for the most part, a thankless job. I have uh, always through the years, and I've known many street pastors who've been involved in different areas, and, and the stories are endless. But one thing always comes, you know, and it's lovely to hear that when, you know, Elizabeth gets into bed, she feels as if it's been a great accomplishment. But when she has to get up an hour later to come to church, you know, or, you know, not even an hour, whatever it is, then it, there's kind of that feeling of, oh, man, I could have used a bit more. And it takes a few days to recover. It is a difficult job to serve. I think of some of the more menial tasks. I think of things like setting up in church. And it's, you know, it's a bit it's a bit of a struggle. I mean, there's really no reward. There's no medal given for people who put tables and chairs away, you know. And, uh, and there's not really anything in Scripture that says if you put out tables and chairs, God has this in store for you. No, it's just a thankless, rewardless type position. And yet God doesn't ever ignore even the least thing. We heard the story about the woman at the well, a strong story. We read other stories about water. I think of the one where Jesus just encouraged the disciples to say, even if anyone gives a cup of water in the name of a disciple, they won't lose their reward. God notices the little things. One of the statesmen in America at its founding was a man by the name of Benjamin Franklin. 
Many believe that Benjamin Franklin would have been the first president of the United States, but actually gave up that uh, nomination because of his age. He thought, I'm just too old for this, and they chose George Washington instead. But Benjamin Franklin, when he spoke, everyone listened because of the depth of commitment and love and knowledge of God that he had. And one of the things he said concerning God, which I've never forgotten, was something I read. He said, and you can almost picture a room full of statesmen being quiet when he spoke, can't you? Somebody of that character. Benjamin Franklin said, if a sparrow cannot fall without his notice, an empire cannot rise without his aid. When we consider all of what God notices, we notice a God who knows not just the hairs on our head. And no, it's an easy job. I always re reluctantly share that verse. But he knows the hairs on our head. He has them numbered. At the same time, this is a God who knows detail who notices little things, who elevates insignificance. He takes things which we consider to be insignificant, and he makes them big. The first will be last. The last will be first. He talks about when you walk into the synagogue, he'd say, don't take the first seats, take the last seats. Because if you take the first, they can always kick you out and put you in the back. This is a paraphrase, not a, yet on the market. And then, but on the other hand, if, if you're in the back, he can move you to the front. I believe God actually wants to elevate us. He wants to lift us up. Yes, when we talk about worship, it is about us being able to praise God. But God's desire is to elevate us. And you say, no, 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 God, I can't cope with that. I can't cope with that. You're the one worthy. You're the one. And he says, yes, but what did he even do to Peter who fell before him? The disciple on his knees before him saying, I'm unworthy. And what does he do? He picks him up. He raises him up. That's what God wants for us. And as we look at this whole year ahead of us, Consider the fact that God wants good things to happen in your life this year. His desire for you is good things to happen in your life this year. You have a purpose. He has chosen, he set out, he's designed, as we heard last week, before the foundation of the world you were in his mind. He has a purpose for you. He has a plan for your life. That means that there is order. Sometimes we look at the things that we have. Have you ever been to the grocery store? I know this is true. It's always talked about. You go to the grocery store to pick something up. You get home. You got something, but it wasn't what you went for. And you remember you got to go back. Our lives are full of that kind of thing. We are full of mistakes. I intended to do this, and I did this instead. I purposed to do this, and I ended up doing this. And, and our life is always in disarray. But when God, almost like he's a magician, when God shows you his hand and you look at it, and he says, wait a minute, you mean you planned for me to do that? You mean you knew I was going to make that mistake? You knew that that was going to happen to me. It never was something that I did that surprised you. It really was according to your plan. Yes, you have a purpose. He has a plan. He made you a promise. Your promise is something you can cling to. You don't have to wonder. Listen to that. You don't have to wonder if God loves you. You don't have to wonder if he has something in store for you. You look around the room and you say, okay, I can understand. Yeah, them, yes, okay. They have a God, yes, I see that that person is, has, is special to God, but, but not me. Yes, you. Every one of us, he has a plan for us, a purpose for us, and a promise. He's given us a promise. Stand on that. Cling to that. Never lose sight of that. Never 
let go of that. That's the hope that we have because of who he is. He knows. He knows what the future holds for you. Hang on to that. Look forward to that. Let's pray.